I just put out a call because like I was just reading like I've been reading ahead a little bit so I can kind of keep sure. ahead of the group but like yeah, I can open it. like S3 I I mean like I kind of I think it's just because it's just a lot of new concepts like that I'm trying to like keep in my mind you know but at the same time it's just like I, I kind of I I, I base I understand the basics of it but I just want to like maybe no. I, don't, I actually hey, maybe I don't right. understand the basics of it like I was just wondering if there's like an elementary introduction to S3 because like Hadley in his in his version it's it's advanced R so it's advanced but I don't feel like I have the you know the background knowledge to be like oh this is how this is S3 simplified <laughs> kind of thing so um I had some similar feelings this week did you check that book hands-on programming with R you've referred to me to that before I think I haven't. Um, I probably should look at it. I just put out a call to like the to the advanced R to be like, hey, does I'll anybody have that anything that's a little more accessible? <laughs> I know. I I I I mean, so much of what I've put here is um, just from the book itself <laughs> because I didn't. I in, in the language from the book because I didn't. I I didn't want to. Um, mislead or I, I don't know like, yeah, I'm, I'm really this is this is I, I I forgot actually I got into trying to learn about object-oriented programming a couple of years ago and I must have blocked it out because I, I now I'm only now am I remembering how horrible <laughs> it's I, I did post the chapter from hands-on programming in R which is maybe a, a slightly I mean it's not going to in that book he doesn't go into all the details of uh you know worrying about the implementation as much as Hadley does, right? Yeah. Constructors, validators, and and I'm just like, yeah. I'm like, I don't even know how to do an S3 object, but I'm kind of yeah. So it. the point of validators and all that is that's more like good, that's more like best practices stuff, right? That's not like part of the S3 system. Mm. Just right. So you gotta keep those things separated, I think. Yeah. And the basic S3 thing is relatively simple. You just have an attribute called class on a, on your uh, any objects you make, right? Which you would post that out using structure, or you can make a little constructor function that would do it, right? Uh, yeah. For you, that's just for convenience. Um, and then defining the methods, right? So you have to define the, you could define methods for built in things like print, pretty straightforward, like print.myclass, define the function. Of course, you have to know some things about how print's supposed to, what kind of things it expects, but. Um, and then to define your own methods, you just use that, you know, use method thing and off to the races. Mm -hmm. Off to the races, yeah. But that's kind of the simplest <laughs> explanation of it. But Hadley, of course, goes into a lot more detail in chapter 13, the unlucky chapter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But fortunately, we know that Robert's going to be here next week explaining all this to us in the exquisite detail. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure, man. I, I think um, he had got probably a good handle on it because he's got a lot of experience with other languages too. So yeah. I think I think it's it's clear in this group who is like the computer science people and who are like the non-computer science because this is <laughs> this is probably where we're separating this probably more. <laughs> yeah. which is this is cool. I'm just glad we got you, Ron. That's all I can say is because um man. I hope I can add clarity and not muddy things up. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always well, a problem is, I have sometimes. I start yeah. saying my biggest problem with explaining things is that sometimes I'll just start, oh, oh, I know about this. Let me start explaining it and I'll start talking and I realize that I actually don't have a good place to start with this you know, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> i haven't thought no, about no. how to explain this to somebody that doesn't have all these other pieces you know yeah i do that to my wife all the time she's like just shut up <laughs> <laughs> uh well it looks like robert is, is not with us so i'll just go ahead no. and get started is that cool yeah, yeah that sounds great i think this is going to be pretty short because there's first of all there's not a lot of exercises and it's all conceptual almost for the most part at least i think so right i mean there's a couple coding examples and um yeah yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we've, I think we, our sort of pre-talk has kind of highlighted the the, the point here that is, uh, you know, object-oriented programming is a little more challenging than in R than other languages. Well, actually, I don't know that I can say that because I don't know any other languages really. I mean, I you know, I have some exposure to Python and you know, SQL and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's 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 challenging enough, even if. It's not compared to other <laughs> languages. The closest right? thing I can think of to the way the object-oriented programming works in R to other languages would be would be Common Lisp. Mm. Just like in R and Common Lisp, you've got like multiple different object-oriented programming systems, systems, and people use different ones with different things, and they sometimes conflict, and that all that all makes things much more difficult, right? Because it's like, oh, which object system are you using on this? Well, let me mm -hmm. go see, right? Just adds yeah. an extra layer of complication. 
now there's a new one, right? So even yeah. I think one of the things like I, I I've done a bunch of like little tutorials on this stuff. Like Data Camp had something on like object oriented programming, and I've done like videos and stuff. And I guess maybe if I if I'm being honest, like one of the things I don't really get is is why we need so many different systems. And um, no, that's a great point. I agree. I don't understand why either. Like, and not only just... do we have these systems, but we're we're, we're making another one that's not even yeah. seven. So I, I just I wonder like um, what's the point? I guess, but that's you know what we're here to learn. So um so it evolved oh, and that's why what's that it's because it's, it's kind of it kind of evolved over time it wasn't like somebody sat down like guido and said here's how it's going to work <laughs> right yeah yeah it's funny that you mentioned that the guido thing because yeah I, I hear that a lot about like that's what people love about python is it was planned out so well or yeah or, yeah. or at least planned out <laughs> i mean sometimes right, just, exactly just having right. a plan is good <laughs> yeah that's right. there you go so S3, R6, and S4, the things we'll probably focus on. And, you know, the, the first, uh, S, the, both of the S versions come from base R, and then R6 comes from the R6 package. Um, and the author kind of made this sort of off-the-cuff remark about S3 is the most important, followed by R6 and S4, which is sort of interesting because I've heard, I've heard like, S, uh, I've heard some people say R6 is the most important, but probably they're doing different things. I don't know. We'll see um so yeah this um this i, I wrote this down almost verbatim because I, I wasn't quite sure s3 and s4 use generic function um oop uh, which is rather different from the encapsulated used by most languages so i guess um I, I um yeah so r6 is obviously not is doing encapsulated oop ron is that right yeah r6 is more like traditional java python object-oriented programming which yeah. has the idea of encapsulated state and yeah 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 that's another thing is i guess i didn't realize um yeah I, um i didn't realize that it was so much of a, um that's a thing i mean this is um, this is you know, i'm not a computer science person so this is like i'm not only am i learning r i'm learning about computer science at the same time which is a good time um so functional programming i thought this was you know pretty uh a pretty telling statement uh from the book um because you know i mean mostly we want to we want to do stuff and the way we do stuff is breaking it into, into smaller pieces and, and functions and whatnot but um yeah no i think we wouldn't be here if we didn't realize that we need to learn more about this stuff so what are some of the advantages of each type so um s3 allows you to your functions to return rich results that are user friendly and program friendly internals um yeah so I like this I like this quote so I put this in um you know uh the start so S3 is an informal implementation of functional OOP and relies on common conventions rather than ironclad guarantees <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know why that's uh that's, that seems kind of funny like I didn't realize we needed an ironclad clad guarantee so is that basically like saying okay and this is just completely I don't know because I know a little bit of R6 Mm -hmm. right and i think r6 and again somebody please don't at me if you're watching this later or whatever <laughs> um r6 has a very structured data structure right like mm -hmm. if you want to set up a class you have to do this if you want to set up a method you have to do this but when i was reading and again i read ahead a little bit with s3 it seems like you can do whatever you want with s3 <laughs> like you can define things in whatever structure you want to do so my my wondering is is if that statement's related to that like s3 doesn't have like a formal data structure like the concepts like the abstract concepts you know all apply to oop but there's no like standardized data structure like an r6 that you use to define those those oop you know components but again, I, I defer to the computer science people on that, but that's my interpretation yeah. of it. Yeah, I think that's that sounds right to me too. Yeah. And he was talking so, about in the in the S3 chapter, you talked about like, oh, you can just change the you can arbitrarily take a thing and just edit the class attribute and change it to some other class. So it's broke, you completely break it. That's something you normally can't do. Usually most programming languages make it more strict, so it's more difficult to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so he did mention like so. Um, uh, R six is provides a standardized way to escape copy on semantics. I yeah, that um, I guess I understand because we did talk about copy on kind of modify stuff. Um, 
Yeah, so I thought it was interesting that they talk about R6 being, um, you know, being used in API situations. That's sort of interesting. Um, yeah, and then the S4, uh, I, I, I had heard this before that, you know, it's used a lot on Bioconductor, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with Bioconductor. Maybe. No? A little bit. Just yeah. like a little what, bit. what is it? I was gonna look it up and I forgot. But. I think it's like a bio it's, it's like this offshoot. It's like this, it's um it's kind of like a separate little part of R where like they have I think bioconductor is like it's not just a package, it's kind of like a whole series of like packages yeah. and tools and it's like a lot more controlled because you know in biology, I guess they have a lot of you know different computational needs or something. But yeah, I'm not I'm not super knowledgeable about it. That's um, what I understand is it's like a, it's a group of bio, it's, it's like a bioinformatics people have yeah. like kind of put their own separate, I'm going to say repository, but that's probably not what it all is, but mm -hmm. um, I've heard of it, but I've never, cause I don't work in biology. I don't yeah. use any of it. Yeah. Like you have to like install bioconductor into your R studio, like, or, or something like you have to, it's like you have to download something and install it. And then it's like, you can get their packages, but it's not just like, you can't just go and like, crib individual packages i guess or something but anyway it doesn't matter um why learn this at all that's kind of the question we've been asking a little bit um so you know obviously um we, we talk a lot about classes so um you know the, the type of object you know whatever the type of the object is its class and the implementation of the specific class as a method and you were talking like that ron when we before we got started so yeah yeah I think some of this is just knowing how to use the language, you know what I mean, or how to use the the, the vocabulary. Um, yeah, so classes are organized in a hierarchy so that if a method does not exist for one class, its parent it, method is used and a um, child is is said to inherit behavior. Yeah, that's yeah. So I like this actually. So like um, I, this is actually something I use a decent amount, like ordered factors. I don't know if anyone else does this, but because they don't, I guess some of the um, methods you know aren't specified in that that are in like the regular factor it just comes from that that kind of made sense to me somewhat um the process of finding the correct method given a class is called method dispatch i hadn't heard that before and um yeah these this next couple parts were interesting so the main reason to use oop is polymorphism a developer can consider a, a function's interface separately from its implementation making it possible to use the same function form in different types of input. Um, yeah, so um, I definitely like that. You know, that seems really exciting. I mean, how how we're going to do that? I mean, obviously, I'm still I'm still wondering, but we'll see. But you but, you do use it all the time, right? Because you use yeah. predict, you use fit, and you know those those are generic functions, and it depends what model you have, what they actually do, right? Right. Yeah. So, like for example, we use um. Well, I mean, the, the example I give here yeah. is summary, which of course is you know is is you know um you know specific to the type of data so in the case of carrots you know it's a continuous variable and then we have you know, factor variables and then encapsulation the user doesn't need to worry about the details of an object because they are encapsulated behind a standard interface so so i want to take a step back with like yeah. this idea of like polymorphism is it like mm -hmm. the idea that like and I'm, I'm thinking of it like as a generic right? right like i'm thinking of a generic function like print OOP allows you to write a method to that generic function print. So say like you are developing some set of models that you want to create, mm -hmm. you can extend that generic by writing another method that is like based off of print. So then like when print reach gets it, receives your object that you're passing into it that has like a class attribute to it or whatever, mm -hmm. it produces or, or it, it runs some separate function as in method it does something different to it as it would to some other object am i understanding that correctly ron <laughs> <laughs> well i mean I, i'm not sure what you're I, I didn't quite follow what you said to tell you the truth he, um you I, I guess like what I'm saying is, is like we have these generics, like my understanding is like we have these generics. My thinking is like a generic would be like print, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So we have a generic called print. 
Now, print, if it receives a specific class, like a type of object, mm -hmm. it's going to produce something, right? Or it's going to run some separate way to, to, to process that object that it receives, that class that it receives. Right, yeah. But OOP, you know, how R uses OOP, it allows us to write another method onto that generic print function to process our object in a separate way. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, anyway, no, that's, that's what exactly, I'm thinking. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, print is, if you go into your R thing right now and type out the word print, you'll see it come back with a simple function that I think, I don't have R installed in this mm -hmm. computer yet, but it'll say use method because I think it's an S3 method. So that's all it does. So use method is kind of the secret sauce behind, we'll learn that mm -hmm. in chapter 13, but um, that's, that means you can write your own print method as well if you have your own object and yeah. that's the that's the polymorphism so yeah. the, the actual Colin, implementation is it depends on the class of the object basically Colin, i don't really know much about what's going on but what you just said made a lot of sense to me uh so i, I think yeah i think it made yeah it, it, you got it right I got, yeah it sounded good, good um yeah so like in in colin's example we have two variables that get different output depending on what type they are so maybe there's like a type of a variable that isn't covered under summary or something like that and so part of Colin's you know project is to make a, a new method or, or um or a, another way of like dealing with a different kind of an object or variable or something like that. is that fair to say I think that's what I'm saying right yeah. like you're yeah, basically yeah. just you're just extending these generic functions like there you these go. generic that's a good way to call it. extending is yeah. a good way to call extension it. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Because these these generic functions, like the way I understand it, and this is probably not the way to think of it, is like these generic functions are like floating around in the R landscape, right? And right. so you have the ability to modify them to process whatever object, object OOP object that you want, I guess, is what I'm right. saying. But, yeah. So, whatever S3 object, I guess, in that sense. But. Yeah. Yeah, because you can directly call the object version of the function by yeah. doing print dot object name. So like, there's a print dot data frame, for example, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then if you just use print, all it does is look for if there's mm. a print dot data yeah. frame. Yeah. And it then if dispatches there, on the yeah, class, essentially, yeah. that's where the dispatch comes in. It's oh, like, that's yeah. what the dispatch is. Yeah. So, like, so print is you... like your little, your little, little uh, conductor there. And he's going to say, oh, what kind of class do I got? Oh, this one? Okay, good. I'll just call print dot data frame and it sends it off to there. That's all it does. That's awesome. Dispatches it. Yeah. yeah. But that's Perfect. a topic for chapter 13, really. But, yeah. Although it helps eliminate what we're doing here. Yeah. So uh, the two main paradigms one is encapsulated to OP, and then another one is functional. So in the first, it's basically the methods belong to objects and classes. Um, and the method calls typically look like, you know, you have just the, sort of the function and then two argument calls. So uh, I think encapsulated OOP is kind of what you were talking about calling in your example and what Ron was kind of talking about. Yes. Or I don't know. No, no it's functional. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's what's confusing mm -hmm. though, because we, we just, you know, stone just mentioned, we were just talking about the dot syntax for, um, right. You know, but it's the other way around with the S3, right? It's, it's method name dot object class. Mm -hmm. Whereas with encapsulated OP, it's actually not even a class. It's actually an instance of the object. And then you dot whatever you put a dot and right. you put the function, the method there. Uh, so this, the syntax even causes confusion, especially if you're somebody coming from Python, where like you know, yeah, where that dot is used in exactly that way, in the way of the encapsulated OOP, what he calls encapsulated OOP. Um, but the idea That's... is that the the methods are now associated instead of it's almost like a different decomposition, right? And the encapsulated method, the object, the the methods, the functions are associated with the object itself in some way, even though it's not really truly inside the object so pointer off to some function table somewhere it tells it what functions it knows right so the object is the one that knows what 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 function to call because it actually has a direct link to that function you're supposed to call so if i'm using encapsulated version of print which doesn't exist and i had some particular data frame called df i say and this would be exactly what you do in python by the way df dot print and that's it not no arguments but it's two parentheses right and uh the print that gets called is already known because you the object uh the data frame it already knows where that function is right whereas in the functional approach print is what you call print and then the date print data frame right and then print is the one that knows 
where to find the right function, right? Because it has, you know, looks up in some big tables. Oh, this is this, this class. I know where that function is. So it's a kind of a different, it's kind of the same thing, but looked at in two different ways or done in two different ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helped or not. Like I said, sometimes I think I'm, I'm, I'm muddying things rather than making them clear. No, no, I mean, <laughs> you cannot make this worse, Ron. That is, that is, that, <laughs> it must that be I pretty bad. That, that. <laughs> well, I, 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 well, I was thinking like, it's, it's I, I mean, I don't know Python as well as I know R. I, I know, know it a little bit, but like, Python uses encapsulate encapsulate yes. OOP, right? Yes. Okay, because that's why it's always so confusing to me when I try and like, yeah. switch over to learn Python. Is that they're always talking about you have this object class, and then you have this method that you attach attach onto it, and you have this dot. And so I'm just like, what? And it might be it make more sense because they're using you know object oriented programming in Python more than they are using like functional programming. And yeah. I'm going on this. Tread lightly there because I don't want people to at me. Yeah. No, um, you're right. But... By the way, just one of the things about the dot notation, when I first started learning R coming from the world of Python, JavaScript, Java, uh, C, right? Or C++, um, you name it, that dot syntax literally, it's always used for uh, a method call or field selection on an object where the first book I was reading involving R used a lot of variable names or things like, oh, data dot frame or, <laughs> you know, fit dot one i'm like what what's the one method do with fit i have no idea <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he does mention that in his book that sometimes that does cause problems where the dot um has kind of two meanings one is just kind of a, a part of a variable name and the other time is actually a syntactical operator right right all right um so they do talk about this sloop package which is um has the O type uh, function, which allows you to check like what system is being used. So, you know, if you were just going to talk about numbers one through 10, you know, obviously that's base and then M2 cars, you know, S3. So, yeah, that was it. So, th that was all from the sort of the introduction, which you talked, you um, um, brought up with me, um, Colin. So, then chapter 12 is pretty simple i don't i don't really know i mean in terms of it doesn't really um well we'll see we'll kind of see what, where we go from here but i mean basically because we're just trying to talk about you know how these base types kind of funnel into you know all of the other systems i did like this because i will be honest with you for the first like two or three years i was doing r this is what i thought object-oriented programming meant like so and, and, you know like this whole john chambers quote which of course is super famous in the community um <laughs> yeah so i kind of thought like object oriented programming and functional programming were the same thing like when i was really new to this um does anyone else have that experience because of that quote i don't know but that was me um yeah so not everything everything is an object but not everything is object oriented so yeah there you go yeah, uh, if you probably go back probably to one of the first book clubs that I did in R for DS. And so yeah. I'm 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 correcting the record now because I would sit there and I would say like, oh, R is a functional programming language or R is object oriented and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, back then I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I'm correcting the record. If uh, if somebody watches that video, my mindset has changed, especially with this quote of the everything that exists in R is an object, because that is, com yeah, it's changed. So yeah. Also, if you're watching both all of those R for DS videos and these, I feel sorry for you, but that's a whole <laughs> other discussion for those. That's but probably we're that's, we'll, we'll probably end up doing that too. So who knows? Um, so the difference between base and object-oriented objects is that object-oriented objects have a class attribute. So presumably this, I don't know, these, uh, this doesn't have a class attribute. I don't know. Um, okay. So the class function is um, safe to apply to S3 and S4 objects, but it makes, but it returns misleading results when applied to base objects. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So instead of using class, you should use this S3 class thing. So this is interesting, right? So if you were to create this matrix and then you look at the class, it tells you it's a matrix and it's an array. Then when you use this S3 underscore thing, it tells you um, the implicit class that the S3 S4 will, will use to pick methods. So that was interesting, I guess. Um, anyone else think, yeah. 
that was interesting. I guess I don't really know why this is an integer and not an array, but whatever. I, I think it goes back to our start with like where we were talking about like vectors, like when we started like the, the chapter on vectors, right? Like everything is built on a base type. Right. And so, um, and maybe I'm wrong, but, yeah. and then class, you know, because, well, if you have a base type, but if you're going to build off of that base type, you have to attach attributes onto those base types to get something else. Right. right. And so when you call class on some of these other objects, you might not necessarily be get what you would expect, like right. with matrix and array. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting where it mentioned something like where like some some objects are created to hide yeah. there. And I was just like, that didn't make sense to me at all. I was just like, so I guess like the main point that I got out of this is like, be careful if you use class, use the yeah. S3, the sloop S3 class, because there's situations where like certain objects are written to hide their implementation. But I don't hmm. know if anybody else has anything else to add to that, but I'm just kind of um, talking right now. Not me. Um, oh, so yeah. It, um, yeah, so this is the base type for this is an integer. Also, I thought this was interesting, right? There's 25 different base types. I didn't include them all just because, you know, it was yeah. a bit of pain in the butt, but um, a lot of that made sense to me. Um, yeah, so this 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 is another sentence that I was like, um, base types do not form an OOP system because functions that behave differently for different base types are primarily written in C that use switch statements. So, okay, that, that, I guess that makes sense. So if a lot of the... Uh, the base level kind of our stuff is written in C that it makes sense. It wouldn't sort of work with the rest of the OP systems. And then um, the last thing that kind of finished was with this numeric type, um, which is interesting because I actually have been guilty of this, of using this um, or, or having problems with this. So in some, in some places, numeric is used as an alias for the double type. For example, it, as numeric is identical to as double and um, numeric is identical to double. Um, like, for example, and then there's also other examples where, um, well, I don't know if this, this isn't the same thing, but like in case when, like, you, you, you if you want to specify like a NA variable, you have to use NA real. You can't, you can't say NA numeric for whatever reason. So um, that, let me talk about that in the book. So, yeah, in S3 and S4 systems, numeric is a shorthand for either integer or double types, and um, it's used when picking methods. Um, yeah, and then one of the, I thought this was interesting. I consistently use numeric to mean an object that of type integer or double. So yeah, I don't know anyone else take anything from that. I take that I'm gonna guarantee you screw that up later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. And then I'll remember. Well, if you go back to like section 3.2, like right. that, that graphic, where it breaks it down from like atomic vector and you have three different atomic vectors, you have logical, numeric, and character. And then you have two numerics, which are technically integer and double. And so it just goes back to that, like back to those like early chapters where it's like, hey, everything is built off of an atomic vector. So, and yeah, so it could be numeric. And I even think we had like an exercise that asked that question, like, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. But yeah, there's technically two numerics. There's integer and double. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's that's all I had for now. Um, but um... I guess my question is, is like, is there is there a way to see all the generic functions that are available? In an, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess like I guess in base or something like that, is there a way to like list out like all the generic functions? Mm. Or do you just have to know them? Yeah. Good question. I don't know. I mean- Because I thought I there would be like a question mark generic. Sorry, Stone, go ahead. I mean, I think you can list all, all the functions, but I don't know if there's like a- Yeah, there's a thing for, I forget what it's called too, like, Methods, maybe if so, there's a way to get all the method, all the the methods for a single like print. Everybody, every known instance of print dot whatever, you can print those all out. 
hmm. list them out. But I forgot how to do it now already. It's probably maybe it's in the sloop package. I don't know. Yeah, it looks like there's a is generic um, function in methods, and then if you I guess if you just dump out all the functions in base and then call is generic, that might work. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you could you could go that route. I was wondering if there was like a, an internal like documentation somewhere that you can go like question mark generics and it would lay it all out of all the ones that are available in base or something. Um, Let's try it. Let's just take a look. Because like the whole idea of like generics, like that's just like for the longest time. Well, this conversation tonight has helped me better understand it, but like. Everybody talks about generic functions, generic functions. It's like, where are these functions? Like, are they just, are they in base? Like, are they, like, where are they? <laughs> They're yeah. wherever the particular um, package that defined them is, right? And sometimes, often I think you're in the namespace too, so you can't actually get to them. But there is a sleuth function to pull them out if you really want to see the bodies of them. So could I define my own generic function? Absolutely. That's the, cool, that's the, the neat thing, right? Hmm. To define your own generic function was in S3 anyway. It's just a matter of defining the function and calling immediately calling use method. That's it. You're done. Now you want to define your particular uh, methods for particular classes. You then use that dot syntax. You know, Collins function dot Collins object, and then or Collins class. You know. Oh, so I could write my own print generic, and then right. I could define all the different classes in that generic or that that generic can use. And then all the different methods. Well, no, that... you shouldn't think of it that way. You should think of you just going to define the class of the U. Somebody else could come around and define a new class that also uses your same generic interface. And right, that's the beauty of it, right? That you don't yeah. have you don't, you don't have to know all the possible future uses of your new function, whatever it is. Like whenever they invented predict, there's probably only a few things that uh, methods for predict. And then later, someone say, hey, hey, you know what? This I have a new model. I want to use. Um, I'm going to also use predict, right? So I define. I'm going to define how predict works with my my uh, model. Yeah, and you can do the same thing. But that's in that's um, what we'll um, Robert's going to tell us about next week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, as far as how it works in R six, I really don't know. I haven't read that far ahead of the book. <laughs> well, I think it comes back to that idea of like you know that it has a structured system behind it, like. When I was reading, because I knew a little bit about R6, like it has a very specific way to define classes and a very specific way to define methods, so on and so forth. But when I was reading S3, it just seemed like you could do whatever you wanted. You know, you could just do, hey, you can yeah. do whatever you want with this. So yeah, it just felt again, like, like S3 is a little different. You don't, so when you define it, like I think R6, I'm looking ahead of myself, it looks like an R6 is kind of like writing a Python class, right? You'd say, okay, here's the attributes, here's all the, the methods that can be called on this object. I list them all out, right? Um, and that's it. And then if I inherit from some other thing, I, I can have other methods, but this, that's it, right? So it, like I said, it divides up the, the space differently. Yeah. Whereas in S3, I'm like, oh, I want to define a print function. I want to show this thing works in a summary. I want to show how it works with a predict. I can tell R how all these things work with my, my objects. Yeah. Like one package I've seen do it is they define their own plot function because it's like a time series of droughts. And then when they plot, because they have some sort of list with all the data you need for it. So it plots the time series, but then it also colors it. So if it's the drought metric, then it's red. And if it's not drought, it's blue. And so they define their own plot dot um, yeah. function. So that way, when you call plot on the object model that's fit, it automatically creates like the nice visualization instead of getting just the generic, you know, scatter plot. Yeah, well, that's right. So the same kind of principle does apply with the encapsulated style too, though, right? So mm -hmm. like I said, you can define like, for example, in Python, there's a similar situation when you define a model, you can define a print a method, a plot method, a predict method for your models like an SK learn, um, but they're defined as instance methods as it were on the on the object so that you, you know you would find a new object because okay here's how i do all these things you know right yeah and they're called differently instead of you know like i said instead of print object you're going to do or plot plot uh, model you're going to do model dot plot i guess stone would you happen to remember what that package is because that is something that i am struggling with right now is 
trying to figure yeah. out different plot. And th- I, I had a feeling like S3 or R6 oh. would help me solve this problem. Right. What was with... that plot package you showed me last time? That's pretty cool. Oh, that's SJ plot. That's a really cool package for uh, plotting. Yeah, it is. Because it sounds like, because like, sound what you were, too. Like, like what you were explaining we, was the same issue that I had was like, you know, I'm trying to create a forecasting model, right? But I want different plots for the different types of forecasting model that's being created. And so it sounds yeah. like OOP might be the way to solve it. Yeah, the, um, so the package is called SPEI. I think it's all caps. Install it on this laptop really quick. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, Anyways, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Ron. <laughs> uh, no, no worries. I'm just rambling. <laughs> um, right. So, spy package. Up's a little slow. So, um, triple. So, yeah, so they have their own plot function here. And it basically is just a function that takes their object and then extracts out what they want from it and then plots it out. Um, let, me, let me see if we can get an example going. Hmm. Yeah. Uh. Kind of annoying, but yeah, you can look at that package and they like have their own um, plot function implemented. So then when you just call plot on their fitted object, it generates like a nice um, graph and does like colors and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I'm struggling with that right now. Like there's just opportunities where like you have a specific data set that you want to create some type of model from or use a specific model but you want to also create a plot from that as well. And so it's like, you know, you can write all these different functions for it, but it would be easier if you just write your own kind of method, like a plot method. And then mm. when you have this object that's named for the specific data set that's creating this data frame or this, this model, then you could just have the plot method, just plot it out what you want. Yeah. So it seems like it would be a lot, it would be a better approach than what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. That you just like, so you just like add a class name to it and then write a function that's plot.class name. And then inside that function, you can do all the gnarly code that you want to do to do the plot. But then when you call plot, just plot on the object, then it automatically figures out how to find it and like hides all the nasty code um, from the user essentially. That makes sense because like, I just, I've noticed that like when you start doing like, when you start using like ggplot2 stuff and you want to do a lot of different plots, but with some variation to it, it's like the code just gets really like, yeah, yeah. gets really bloated and you're just like, oh man, this is a lot. But I think probably a better approach would be to approach it with a, like an OOP kind of mindset. So <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that's all I had, um, guys. Sorry, it's a short week. <laughs> no, this is this is great. Lucky, <laughs> <laughs> lucky, because next week, uh, just hold on, um, <laughs> yeah, strap in. Sure. Uh, it seems like it seems like S three is a little bit of the wild west, you know. <laughs> I'm looking yeah. forward to learning more about how these things work in R, because, for example, I don't know, like, can you define like what if I have an R six object, but I also want to be able to like overload print for it, right? Is that something you can do? I have no idea. I mean, mm. I mean, it sounds like you're going to have a lot of flexibility to do with what, whatever you want. So I'm sure there's a way. Yeah, there must, there must be a way because that's going to be a common thing. Um, yeah. 
question is, is can you do it without shooting yourself in the foot? You know, <laughs> that's, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you say that because he mentioned that in chapter, in the chapter 13. <laughs> It's about avoiding bullet foot intersections as a challenge or something like that. He puts it yeah. in some funny way. <laughs> and I, I think I think he concludes is like, yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot, but if you just don't pull the trigger, then you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. I mean, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I guess uh, like other languages, like are they really strict on their OOP implementations? Like I know you mentioned Lisp, right? But it sounds like from from like the perspective of like Python, it's like very specific how you have to define your OOP, like your methods and your classes. Is that right? Yeah, but you it is somewhat fle more flexible than other languages like C++ or Java, right? Because like it's Python, you can add it on additional attributes after the fact, for example, which is something mm -hmm. that's not commonly allowed in most languages. Depends on how strongly typed they are to you, right? So Python, R, all these languages are dynamically typed, I guess you call it, but like C++ and Java, they're statically typed. So you're you have to commit early <laughs> to how things are going to look so then so then like when the book when this chapter mentions like the idea of like the base types are written in c right like yeah. the base types are written in c does that basically mean c does not have like like an oop system oh, yeah. no it doesn't okay so then that's where the argument was like hey like you know the r core is not going to add any more types to it you know to support anything else because it's just you know it doesn't allow you to do these some of these more i don't want to say complex things but for the lack of a better term but it well, just you can do anything and see i mean <laughs> it's just expressing them right so you, i c doesn't have a built-in object learning system but you could certainly craft one i mean the original c plus plus was just a c preprocessor that would like convert the c plus plus classes and everything else into a c code Mm -hmm. using pointers and everything else to, to make it work but mm -hmm. and switch statements <laughs> of course yeah that's what i was wondering is is like is it just actually, like no, use v tables but yeah you use actually use it you read this is probably way off field but just to give you a feel for it you know the way actually even the way it's implemented now in c plus plus and in other languages the class right an object has a pointer to some cl class object which is really just a table of functions they call a v table a virtual table which will tell it which you know when i when i want a certain function i look up where the address of that function is and then call it right mm. that sounds like r6 like it sounds like r6 yeah that's like... that's very much how um an encapsulated uh, version works right you mm. carry around this pointer to a v table so i know what what my class can do what my object can do i mean mm. although c++ is more complicated because not all functions are virtual you have to actually tell it that it's virtual though mm. Not really huh. in far field. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just weird. It's just interesting because you know you got to understand. Like, I mean, from my perspective, when you when you read this with the base types, it's it's calling C base types or base types defined in C. So yeah, you know, ultimately, you know, to know the base types, you have to kind of understand a little bit about the base types are written in C. You know, on the back end of it, you know, those things don't change. So do you really need to know it? Probably not. But like, if you want to dive into it. You have to kind of understand that like on the base of it the base types that we use to build all of our stuff is written in c yeah that's at the very bottom of everything i guess right <laughs> that's how the world runs i guess <laughs> it's all written in c <laughs> <laughs> which um it's kind of interesting i think you can actually read if you read our if you read the r extensions manual and you read the base type stuff they'll they they present all of the different base types that are available oh that's some good bathroom reading i'll tell you what <laughs> that's some, that's i've tried i've stuff. tried reading the, i've tried reading the r extensions and when you get to that point you're I'll just, just like print out the r source code and go from there <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I mean, you, I mean, writing, if you ever read the writing R extensions book, like, or the manual, it's, it's pretty, let me tell you, it's some pretty compelling yeah, reading. I'm just curious, but here, I'll, I'll link it for you. You can peruse it in your own. I, I have that like sitting in my to, to be read file probably for like the last 10 years or like, <laughs> so, uh, or it's probably, it's funny that you mentioned that. Cause it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I'll probably look at that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I tried one time and it's like, nah, it's, it's, I mean, maybe one day when I get more, if I get more advanced, but like, yeah, but if you want to know all the base types, I think, I think they're listed in here. So, um, but you can look them up if you want base types anyways. 
Yeah. Well, cool. Well, um, I can hang out for a little while longer if people want to chat a little bit more, but um, since we're kind of done, if, if people want to jump off, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, yeah. I really appreciate everybody jumping in. I think Robert isn't with us today, but he said he's going to be ready for next, next week. week. So we'll jump into chapter 13. Just a heads up. Uh, we're kind of coming up on the, um, we're coming daylight up on the, yep, daylight savings time madness here. So we'll meet <laughs> next week yeah. and then uh, we'll have like a two week kind of break, which is good. Cause I think we're, we're, we've been trucking along pretty well. So yeah. be good for kind of a two week break or something, but just kind of keep that heads up. I'll remind everybody next week, but um, after next week, we'll have like a two week break and then we'll be back towards the end of March, but keep cool. everybody uh pace with that so well cool well if nobody else has anything else to say um have a good rest of your week and i'll see everybody next yeah, week you too take care guys see you, see you later yeah. bye bye